All righty. Clay's my man. It's great to have you, brother. Let's uh, let's get this yeah. off, man. The floor is yours. Well, cool. Well, thanks for having me, Gary. Um, the first guy that won that uh, that first award, Corey Friesen, he was he was chirping me at the rink like 20 minutes ago. So I don't think you should send it to him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but well, um, first of all, I just want to thank you, Gary. Um, you just been a huge impact on my life. And, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit tonight um, of just how, you know, one person can change someone's life. And, uh, and you've been that for me and that will never end with, you know, with all of us on this call tonight of just how we can always impact the people around us. So uh, pure encouragement is an amazing ministry and that's uh, really cool to see. So I, uh, I really appreciate everything you do, but my, my story, um, I'm going to, I'm going to start young and then I, I know I don't have a lot of time tonight, but I just want to, <clears throat> I want to start a little bit of, you know, how I started and everyone's got their story. Everyone on this call tonight, <clears throat> they have their story of, of just, you know, what their life has been like. And when Gary and I, we, we actually talked about this behind the scenes call about, you know, four or five months ago, I don't know how long ago, but the, the idea was just kind of get in someone's life and see, you know, what, uh, you know, what their story is and, and then how, how we can encourage each other and how we can uh, impact the, the world for Jesus. And so I know there's not just hockey players on the call tonight. There's what other sports are there, Gary? Lacrosse. There's some lacrosse, lacrosse. There's a lot of lacrosse guys. And then I know there's a lacrosse. lot of players that play other things too. So, yep. Yeah. So, so lacrosse is one sport I didn't play growing up, but it's exploded here in the last 20 years. I was a baseball guy growing up, but I grew up in a little town called Peak in Illinois. And, uh, and it was a, small little town uh, I was born in 1976 so I was an 80s kid and um, even from a young age I remember um, that there was a stirring in my heart you know of 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 God just being you know just want I wanted to do something great in life and so um, so when I was a little guy um, I'm the youngest of four kids so I I have two older brothers and and one older sister and my two older brothers um, they played hockey so I started playing hockey <clears throat> out of the womb. I started hockey at a young age and, and just fell in love with it and fell in love with everything about hockey. Um, and I grew up and I played competitive hockey growing up. I played competitive baseball, uh, competitive football. And, you know, in the 80s, uh, things weren't specialized are they, like they are nowadays. So, um, so it was kind of funny. I tell people this, people in Tulsa this all the time is, is uh, when my hockey season was over, uh, I never touched a hockey stick <laughs> until the next season. So our off season was from like March to October. And so you don't see that very often in sports nowadays, especially hockey. Um, but, but I just, I just played three sports growing up and, and love sports. And I always tell people we were kind of the, well, I don't really know if a lot of people on this call know who leave it to beaver is, but it was, it was a sitcom when I was a kid, it was just a, a good wholesome family. And we were a family that just, we were good people. We had, you know, breakfast together. We had dinner together. Um, and, uh, my parents loved us, but, and we all, we all, you know, we were good people and we thought, you know, we're good people. And we never went to church. Uh, we, we, we go to church twice a year, uh, usually Easter and Christmas. And as we got older, um, it got a little bit less and, but we just really believed that, you know, just because we were good people, um, that we we're going to go to heaven and we died. And, uh, and, you know, as I got older, um, there was just, there was just starting to become a little bit of a void. I was starting to feel, um, as I, as I grew older and, you know, I started just kind of figuring life out a little bit. And when I was 12 years old, um, I, I, to this day, I don't know how we got the book and, and, um, it was, a, it was an HMI hockey ministries international. And I, I was in seventh grade and, uh, and I remember, I, uh, I read this book and it was, it, and really the reason I read it is because I was really into reading hockey books at that age. So I was in seventh grade and I remember <clears throat> reading this book and, and for the first time, just realizing who Jesus was and how he died on the cross for our sins and, and how we can have eternity with him. And it was just really foreign to me. But as I was reading the book, at this this book was NHL players, and at the end of each chapter, um, the NHL player would talk about um, what it meant to be a Christian and how you can give Jesus your life. And so, 
so I was like 12 or 13 years old when that happened. And, and I, to this day, remember um, that happening in my life. And I gave my life to Jesus that day, not having anyone in my life really that was a Christian. Um, again, we, I wasn't growing up in a Christian home at the time. And, but I remember, and, and, and people on this call that are older, um, you, you know, through life experience, you start understanding how God's hand from that time that you do give your life to Jesus of how he's on your on your life, even when you walk away. And, uh, and so for the next three or four years, I, I did, um, because I really didn't know what I did. I gave my life to Jesus. And I do remember part of the book saying, Hey, now you need to find a local church. And, you know, all these thoughts through the next three or four years of my life, they would come back to me. Um, but I had an idol and it was hockey. And, um, and so I started just continually, um, growing as a hockey player and growing, um, who I was a hockey player. And at that time, um, if you play hockey and if you're older, um, you, you typically leave home to play hockey. And, uh, my son's experiencing that right now in Alexandria, he's on the call tonight. And, and when you, when you get to that age, um, you have to leave home. And so I got to the point where I was getting pretty good. And, um, a funny story that doesn't happen nowadays. Um, if you're a hockey player on this call, Again, if you're a little bit older, it kind of makes sense, but it's kind of funny. But I was playing double-A hockey. I never played triple-A hockey my whole hockey career. And I was playing double-A hockey in my hometown, and I was a Bantam, playing midget, midget double-A. And uh, and I was 15 years old, and so now it was the summer of my 16-year-old year. And my dad said, hey, let's go to Omaha and uh, and just go to the tryout. Um, you got invited to the, to the, to the USHL tryout. Let's just go and just let's we'll see how good you are. Let's see what happens. No expectation to make the team. Um, and so I go in as a 16 year old and, uh, go through the tryout and I have a good tryout. And, um, uh, I go into the office and my head coach was, well, the head coach was Mike Genzel. His son, Jake Genzel plays for the Penguins now. And he called, he calls me in and, um, back in those days, it was like a long line. So you just go one by one by one. And I remember just being in line, just nervous, like just this long line. And, uh, he calls me in his office and uh, I'm just a 16 year old kid. And, um, he goes, Hey, go get your dad. And so I had to walk out in front of everybody that was waiting in line. And they're, you know, they're kind of excited to see if they made the team or not. And I walk out and I have to go find my dad in the parking lot. I bring my dad back in and uh, Mike Genzel says, hey, you know what? You had a really good camp and we want to take you. <laughs> and that was just an incredible time in my hockey career where my hockey career was just taking off. And um, I was the youngest guy in the USHL. And so I don't know if I was the best 16 year old in the country, but, you know, I mean, I was one of the best because I was in the USHL. I was the only 16 year old in the USHL. And so I go down that journey and, um, and, um, and I really thought I made it. I really, I went to Omaha that year and everyone told me, Hey, like you're in the USHL, the best junior league in the United States of America. And you're going to, you're going to do some stuff in hockey. You know, I'm not a big guy. So, you know, like the NHL was going to be hard for me, but a division one scholarship was like a no brainer. And, um, and so I went as a 16 year old and I took my foot off the pedal. And the, the, the first thing I want to share with you guys, I don't care if you're 80 years old on this call tonight, or you're a five-year-old kid that just wants to learn about hockey and Jesus is never take your foot off the pedal in life. Never, ever take your foot off the pedal. There's not one time in your life where you are going to get to the point where you've arrived and that there's nothing more. And as long as you, as long as you have, you know, breath in your lungs, there's more for you to do for God out there. Um, and so I took my foot off the pedal and, um, and I struggled hard. I struggled. So I, I leave. Um, so I, so I took, so I, uh, I, I play there for, for that year and struggled really bad. And then the second year, um, I, I, I came in and I had a really rough year again. Mm. And, um, and so, so I, so I'm two years in Omaha and now, you know, I'm getting a little nervous, you know, like where's my hockey career going. And, and again, hockey was my God. So I got saved when I was 12, went off to this hockey journey and I, and I, I brought a puck, a hockey puck. And, um, this could be a hockey puck for the, 
for the hockey players in this call, or it could be a lacrosse ball or a basketball or a baseball, um, whatever sport you play. But it's very interesting that my brothers and I have talked about this for years, that that there's a devil out there, guys. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life, and he's deceptive, and he's a liar. And we all need to know that. And the devil convinced me that if I score a lot of goals with this puck, that I'm going to be happy in life, that I'm going to enjoy life, that success is going to come for me, and I'll never have another care in the world that I'm going to have, I'm going to be rich and I'm going to have just this life that we picture in our mind that this puck right here is my hope. That's my hope. And that's where it was. And, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, the sinking sand. Like when we have our life, our, who we are on the sinking sand, we fall. But if we're on the solid rock, we can stand through difficult times. And so, so I'm in Omaha in my second year. And like I told you earlier, um, Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. And when I gave my life to Jesus at 12, he never left me. I left him. I went to did my thing. And, and my life is a little bit different. My testimony is a little bit different because I didn't drink. I, I never drank and I never did drugs. But those are the things that are easy when people get on calls like this to communicate like, man, I was an alcoholic and God saved me from her. I was a drug addict or, or whatever, you know, the, the things that like dramatically change your life. But I had internal issues. I was insecure. I was jealous. I was prideful. I was arrogant. All the things that are internal is what I was dealing with that I needed to get saved from. And um, in, uh, no hope, right? I had no hope. I had, I had no idea where my life was going. And so so now I'm 17 years old. I've played two years in Omaha and, and I really feel like my career is like coming to an end. And that's kind of weird to say at 17, but if you play hockey long enough, you understand what I mean is like, man, I went from like the youngest guy in the USHL that figured by the time I was 18, I'd have every college in the country after me to actually after the second year, Mike Genzel and Omaha did not want me back. Okay. So, so now I've, I'm two years in Omaha and this hockey puck was my hope. And all of a sudden, God starts showing up. And I and and towards the end of that year, things weird started happening to me. Like going home and Billy Graham being on TV. And I was actually like with my Billet family's house wanting to watch it for some odd reason. And then, you know, the Billy Graham crusade ends and they they say, if you want a Bible, we'll send one. And I did it not even know what I'm doing. I'm just like, there's just something stirring in me now that I've been a Christian for whatever, 30 years, you know, I understand now. Um, but you know, but through that time, God was doing a stirring in me. And, um, and so the season ends and in hockey after junior season, you go home. And, uh, and so I go home after that season and it's like, man, it's reevaluate time. Like what in the heck am I doing this life? And, and, um, and so God brings a guy, um, named Mark Bassett in my life and, um, and, and he, he changed my life. Um, and so Mark Bassett, he was a pro hockey player and uh, his brother played in the NHL for, you know, 13, 14 years. Uh, Mark never made it to the NHL, but he was a high level. He played in the AHL, IHL, really good player. But again, like I said earlier, how one person changes can change your life and how you guys have an, have an opportunity to impact a lot of people in your life. And so I, I come home and, um, and my brother Butch and Mark Basson were playing for um, the IHL team in my hometown, which is like the AHL. Now the IHL is no longer around, but it was like the AHL. And, uh, and my brother said, Hey, I'm going to invite this guy named Mark Basson over. And he's a born again, Christian. And I just want, like, he was having like a family meeting. He was the oldest sibling. He kind of took control. He said, Hey, no cussing, no doing stupid stuff. This guy is like a born again, Christian don't do stupid stuff. And we kind of laughed about it. And he came over and he said, Hey, so he like hung out with us. He was, you know, just being that guy in our lives that he knew that we were lost. And he said to me, he said, Hey, um, after we were together the whole night, he said, um, hey, I'm giving my testimony on Friday night at a church here in town, and I want you to come. 
And, you know, I'm 17, almost 18 now. And going to a church on a Friday night was unheard of in my world. And so I thought that was the weirdest thing, church on a Friday night. And, uh, and anyway, one thing led to the next. And, uh, and we went, me and my brother, Butch, and now his wife, uh, Jane, but they were dating at the time, and my brother, Carson, his best friend. And that night was the night where he gave his testimony, and um, I gave my life to Jesus again. Um, and that was when I never turned back. That was, uh, that was May of 1994. And so I just aged myself. Um, but, uh, but that was in 1994. And from that time forward, it's been the most incredible journey that I've lived. Um, just so many years of, of just trusting God's word. And, you know, the, the second thing that I, I wanted you guys just to, to take away was, you know, first was never take your foot off the pedal. But the second thing on a spiritual side is God's word is true and it's faithful. And whatever you go through in your life, just trust it. Just trust it. The Bible, it's inspired by God. And everything that you're going through in your life is in his word. And so, again, I don't care if you're a little guy or you're playing pro hockey right now, but his word has been so faithful um, in my life the last 30 years from just, um, you know, just going through that journey of not knowing where my career was. And so um, to where I am now, where, you know, I have a beautiful wife. I think she might be listening in and I got four kids, three of them, three of my four kids are, are listening tonight. My, my daughter's four. So. I don't think she's listening, but, but God's so faithful. And, um, and so going back to what happened after that second year of juniors is, um, is I gave my life to Jesus. I reevaluated, uh, my life and I actually went and in my world, it was taking a step down. I went to the North American league, North American hockey league. And that was a step down from the USHL, but I knew, and my brother's, um, it's a whole other story. I don't have time to get into tonight, but my whole family got saved during this time. And so my brothers got saved also. And they were kind of like my agents in those days. And we like, they're like, Hey, you need to get your game back. You, you need to go back to the North America league. So I go back to the North American league and I score 40 goals. So the year before in the USHL, I think you guys can look the stats up on your own, but I think I scored like 10 goals. So I go to the North American league and, um, and I score 40 again, you guys can look it up. I think it's 40 goals and, uh, and God is just changing my life. Now it wasn't easy. I had to make some crazy changes in my life, just like we all do, uh, when we give our life to Jesus. And, and there was a lot of change going on in me and God was patient with me. Um, which by the way, if you are early in your journey, God's patient, he'll stay with you. So don't, don't worry about the do's and don'ts. Just study God's word, grow in God's word, and he'll be faithful to you. But I, I, I scored 40 goals that year, and, uh, and my career just started taking off. And so, uh, my, so then um, that summer, I get invited to a USA Hockey um, like U18 thing. That was like a, a chosen thing. And I went and I had a really good camp. And, uh, but I really felt like I was supposed to go back to the North, North American league at the time. I don't know why. Um, but I actually, that summer I was drafted by Fargo in the USHL, which was an expansion team at the time, but I still felt like I was supposed to go back to the North American league and, um, and to backtrack one little point, cause this is going to bring, um, a point that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to close here in about five minutes. So stay with me. Um, but, um, when I was in Omaha, my coach, and, and he had probably <laughs> big reasons to say this to me, is when I went to the USA, Channel, I came from a small market and I was the best player like everybody else that goes to the USA. Channel, they're always the best player uh, from where they came from. And so the second year, I made this play in practice, probably stupid. I'm just a kid. Um, and he comes up to me and he says, Clage, you are not a natural goal scorer quit doing that. That's what he said to me. And that was devastating to me uh, because um, just because I thought I was a goal scorer and I was just all over the map. 
and um, and so uh, the map of you know where my emotions were, I was not living an in, inside out life like like Gary talks about. And so now fast forward. So then, um, so then, I'm I'm in the North American League, which is my fourth year of juniors. And a month into the season, the Des Moines Buccaneers call me, Scott Owens, and he calls me and he said, hey, I hear you're a natural goal scorer and I need you on my team now. Can you be here in one day? Now, if you're a hockey player and you're older and you, you're an American, Gary would understand um, this was a big deal for my career. <laughs> I'm going to the North American League and now Des Moines back in the 90s this was 1996 they had just come off the national championship which back in those days um, there was a national championship for uh, junior hockey in the U.S. and so they were the best team in the country and they said we need you now and we hear that you're a goal scorer so just think about in two years I was in Omaha and I was told I wasn't a goal scorer and then two years later I go and I and I'm told I'm a goal scorer. And then I go to the USHL. And again, I, th I think that year I scored 32 goals. I was third in the USHL in scoring, made the all-star game. So just see what God did in two years from career over to now I'm at the top of my game. And that's one big reason why I coach um, is because I do believe that there's power in words and how we can really – um, discourage people and how we can really encourage people. And because what, what I was told in Omaha really discouraged me, but what I was told in Des Moines encouraged me. And I went out and had 32 goals that year. And so that summer I had, I didn't have a scholarship yet. And I'm just really at this time, I'm sold out for Jesus sold out. All my teammates know I'm a Christian. I mean, I, I there was no turning back. And, uh, and, and I was, I was at the HMI camp in the summertime, Hockey Ministries International. Me and my two brothers were serving there. And I'll never forget it. My brother, me and my, my oldest brother were out doing hills during the day. And my middle brother, Carson, comes running out. He said, like, Clage, you just got a scholarship. They just called University of Alaska Anchorage. Now, University of Alaska Anchorage in those days was in the WCHA, which was – arguably the best league Gary probably disagree but um back in those days uh there was a big argument that that was the best college league um in the country and but it was a really cool thing that out of all places you know I was just serving God helping young hockey players you know fall in love with Jesus and and God blessed me and gave me a full right scholarship full right scholarship that, you know, so, so it's just incredible. Like God is a miracle working God and he's so faithful to his promises. And I know I say faithful a lot, uh, but he is, he's so faithful if you stick to it. And, um, and so that kind of launched me. And, you know, again, I know we don't have a ton of time tonight, but the ministry that I've done in the years that I've been a Christian in hockey from, from the North American League to the USHL to um, to college hockey to pro hockey has been just incredible. And now and now being involved in youth hockey, I know a lot of Tulsa kids are on the call tonight. Um, but just having the impact in this next generation of hockey players is so it's just so rewarding, you know. Because the biggest thing um, that I want to do is I want to teach kids not to do the things I did, um, and so. That's how I want to leave tonight is if you guys have a pen handy or your parents uh, phone or whatever, but there was a few things I was just thinking about today is what would I tell my younger self? Like, what would I, what, what would I say to my younger self? Um, if I was, again, I know that the, the spectrum on this call is so, you know, wide tonight from a little kid to, um, you know, to older people. But it, it didn't change. I started just writing this down today. I'm 46 years old. And these are the things that just popped in my mind today when I started thinking about what would I tell myself? Like if I was 16 again and I was going to Omaha, I actually think about that a lot. If I was a Christian, 
the day that I that I stepped into Omaha, would my career have been different? Absolutely would have been. Now, you know, a lot of great things happened. Like I met my wife in Tulsa, um, which is the most important thing to me on this earth. Um, so I would give up the NHL all day long to meet her. So, um, so God has a plan for our life, but these are things that I want you guys to write down tonight that are gold. They are just gold. And I, I really feel like God was just showing me, I couldn't stop writing down today. Cause I was like, and I could have done more, but these are the ones I felt like God wanted me to share with you guys. Um, the first one is be, be eternal minded. And I'm going to explain that real quick is so many times in this world, we're so focused on what's in front of us. If that's, you know, a hockey career or a lacrosse career or a baseball career. And we're just looking at the here and now, and we don't know um, the eternal purpose we're making. There were so many times in my hockey career. I'm like, why am I here right now? Why am I on this team? And, and lo and behold, someone will come across my path that all we're asked to do, guys, as Christians, is open our mouth and let God do the rest. And you don't always have to preach, but there'll be times where you'll be in a position where you can say, hey, you know, do you go to church? Have you ever thought about giving your life to Jesus? Whatever that looks like, but be eternal minded. Don't focus so much on why are why am I here? Or, this is not the best place for my career. Don't look earthly minded because what we're doing is all for eternity. And it really takes all the pressure off when you have that mindset, when you're like, you know what, like what I'm doing right now is for eternity. If we live a long life to 80 to 90 years, which is a long life, is nothing compared to eternity. And the impact we're making is way deeper. So um, that's number one. Number set, number two, and these, these are not in order. I just started writing, but don't stress the small stuff. Okay. So in the, in the hockey world, we get so stressed out, out about, are we on the power play? Are we on the penalty kill? Are we on the first line? Are we on the fourth line? Is the scout in the stand looking at me or is he looking at my teammate? All these things that we get so stressed out about that when it's all said and done, it doesn't matter. And this is why is because God has a plan for your life and it's going to be different than anybody else. My wife says this all the time that there's room at the table for all of us. So my life is way different than Gary's, but guess what? We're both at the table. We're both making an impact in two, two different worlds. And so when you start having a, a, a mindset of, gosh, I'm going to make an impact in my world, the people I'm in front of, then you don't stress the, the stuff that just gets you off track and your mind just really starts wondering. Um, the third thing is be fearless, be fearless in life. I, I, I and, and doesn't change for me today. It's we, we operate in fear and Christians do too, by the way. And the Bible says, man, we can't live in fear that we don't live in fear. If you want to go study the Bible and go from story to story to story, these guys were fearless people. And when you live fearless, then God starts opening up incredible doors for your life and you start making a bigger impact. Um, the next one is laugh a lot. I tell my son Jackson this all the time. He's had some games this year were rough for him. And I, and I tell him, I say, hey, just go laugh. Just go laugh. The Bible says that laughter is medicine to the soul. And I'm telling you, when you're in a stressful moment, if you just get away and just laugh for a minute, maybe that's you just going and just like, just like laughing about um, something in your life by yourself, or maybe it's just going with some friends and saying, you know what, I'm not going to think about uh, what's going on in my life. What's whatever sport that is, or even whatever's going on. I'm just going to laugh a lot. And I'm telling you there's healing there and there's power there. The Bible, everything in the Bible has purpose. And, and God did not throw that in the Bible just to throw it in. It's, laughter is best in the soul. All of a sudden you start just enjoying life more and laughter is important because if you know what, there's a lot of bad in this world and there's a lot of things that can get you down and you can go days without laughing. I've done it. <laughs> it's not, it's not fun. You need to laugh. You need to enjoy life. Um, the next one is living inside out. And, and this is part of Gary's message that has absolutely changed my life. And when I say it's changed my life, 
that's happened in the last eight or nine months. I've been a Christian for 30 years and I can say this message has changed me. And I know we preach this to our players all the time. Gary preaches this to all the calls he's on, but basically an inside out life is knowing that you're valued, knowing that you're loved, that all the outward stuff coming in is not what's important. What's important is what is inside you and what the, what the Bible says about you, which by the way, a little plug for, for Gary's uh, pure encouragement uh, devotional. That's what it's all about. It's just living inside out, living an inside out life. Because when you do that, all the other stuff doesn't matter. It's like, you know what? Yeah. I'm not on the power play today, but that doesn't matter because I know I'm loved. I know I'm cared for. Jesus is not going to say when we get to heaven, he's not going to say, Hey, Gary, tell me about that year at university of Miami of Ohio, where you scored all these goals. He's not saying that he's saying, Gary, great job. My good and faithful servant. You have impacted lives. That's what Jesus is going to say to us. And he's going to say he loves us, you know, and when much more. Um, you are, the next one is you are who you hang out with. The Bible says bad company corrupts good morals. And it's so important in life um, to be around good people, be around people that are going to, that are going to make you a better person. I love being around people like Gary Steffes. Cause you know what? Like Gary will call me. And he'll be like, hey, how's your soul? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. Like, you're challenging me right now. How is my soul? And you want to be around people like that. So I just encourage everyone on this call, evaluate your friendships. Evaluate your relationship. Evaluate, you know, um, ev evaluate who you're spending time with. Sorry, someone's calling me. Um, um, and, and just, and just make sure you're, you're, you're around champions, just be around champions that are going to make you, um, obviously, you know, this is a call about number one, about Jesus and, and be around people that are going to encourage, they're going to encourage you to read your Bible, to trust God, to not, to not freak out in situations, but then practically people that can make you a better athlete or a better, a, a better human being be around those people. Um, Okay, this was a big one that, that came up to me today um, because I dealt with this one when I played. Is live for Jesus, even when you see people around you that we would, you know, quote unquote, are living in sin, being successful. I dealt with that one as a player a lot where I would see someone that just wasn't living right and they'd go out and score a hat trick. But I will tell you this. I wasn't the best player. I'm 5'8". I was a good player, but I wasn't the best. And I'll tell you that I outplayed my longevity of my career more than most players I played with in college. I think all of them, actually. I don't know if there was one guy that played longer than me. And I was not the best player. But I lived for God. And you know what? The Bible talks about this in the Old Testament about, like, I think it was David saying, they were here, and now I can't find them. Um uh, Gary probably knows that verse better than I, but just basically it's saying, hey, you know what? They were being successful. They are probably being arrogant and prideful in the midst of them being successful. But when you look at life years later, it's like, where are they? I don't even know where they're at anymore. And when you keep your eye on Jesus and when you do the right thing and when you grow in your faith through time, you're going to see the Bible says we, that we're known by our fruit. And what that means is that people can look at our lives and say, oh, man, that, that's not him. That, that's Jesus living in him. Man, look at look at what he does. Look what he's look. Look who he's reaching. What, whatever success looks like. I mean, that, that's fruit that Jesus has given us. And so I just encourage you guys, if you're in that life where maybe you're in a hockey locker room and you're and because what's tempting, if you're not strong, is you'll be like, huh he's doing this and he's scoring hat tricks. Maybe I should start doing that. And that is a slippery slope. It doesn't work. Actually, that's what I did in Omaha. I did that and I wasn't saved, but I did. I, I look at the best players and then I would mock them and I would say, Hey, I, I specifically remember one situation where a guy, he had a piece of cake before a game, before his pregame meal. And he went out and had a huge game that, that night. And guess what I did the next game. I said, you know what? I'm going to try that. I'm going to have a piece of cake for my pregame meal. And guess what? I stunk it up. So, um, so don't live that, that way. 
Um, and then the last one that I wrote down that, uh, that actually prompted me when Jackson prayed tonight, my son, Jackson, when he started praying, he said, every day is an opportunity. Wow. How cool is that? That every day is an opportunity. It doesn't matter what, what happened yesterday. It doesn't matter what next week looks like. And the Bible talks about that a lot. Don't worry about tomorrow and don't worry about the past, but what, what can we do today? What can we do to impact people around us today? And I feel like that was so powerful to end with tonight um, because that's the life we live is if we can wake up every day excited about, hey, this is where we know what the Bible says about God has put us places. Now let's make the best opportunity out of it. And so I hope this encourages you tonight. Um, you know, I know my life story isn't um, this dramatic, like coming to Jesus and and in one day, for me, it was gradual. It was a gradual process for the last 30 years. And, and that's important to me. I want to be, a, I want to be a Christian that's consistent and that when people, you know, when my life is done, that's one thing I want people to say about me is, is man, he was just a consistent Christian every day, just showed up every day. That's important. And I think we need that in people in people nowadays more is just be a consistent believer every day in good times and bad times, whatever, just be consistent. So Gary, thank you for the time. And um, I think you wanted to open it up for some questions. Yeah, we, we'll get there, man. That was absolutely fantastic. Clapes, thank you, man. I, I'm taking notes and I'm impacted, man. I wish I would have known these things when I was, when I was younger too. I, I laugh at some of them because I'm like, dude, I missed the boat so bad in my early days too. And, and thank God, man, he saved my life just like yours. I thank you for sharing. You know, so I, I got a couple thoughts. I want to debrief a few things with you before we pass it on to questions. Guys, uh, if you have a question for, for Clage, uh, I would love for you to start putting them in the chat bar. Okay, if you if there's something in his story that, that impacted you or you have a question about, please put it in the chat bar. I will visit this here in about uh, a couple minutes and uh and then we can talk about that. But but Clage, let me let me let me share with you what God was putting on my heart. As you're sharing, uh, of all the things that you share, okay, uh, and there's a lot of huge nuggets that came out of this. Everything from never take your foot off the pedal. Come on. Massive, massive encouragement. For me, the year that I scored 50 goals in the ECHL, uh, that summer I had worked my tail off and I had, I had trained, I'd done some extra things. Uh, you know, just studying film, fighting to be able to become a better goal scorer, taking steps of faith to, to take risks and try to do some things that, you know, honestly, I wasn't sure I could do. Uh, things like you were even alluding to, your coach told you that you're not a natural goal scorer. I, I had times where like people just telling me I'm not, a, I'm not an offensive player like that. And so for me to break through the barrier took a lot of courage and a lot of just risk and, and faith. And so for me that year I did it, but the year I scored 50 goals and I was a captain of the team and we win the championship and I have the year of my life, I go back to the American League. Uh, I'm the closest I ever was going to get to the NHL. I'm on the cusp of the NHL. Uh, that next summer, I did what I did, what you did, the way that you said it. I took my foot off the gas. I got complacent. I got relaxed because I thought I'd made it. I thought, oh, I don't have to do the stuff that I did last summer because I mean, I'm already, I'm a goal scorer. I've already done this. And, and, and the funny thing, Clay, for me is I knew what I was doing. I knew it. I knew in my head that I was being complacent and I shouldn't do it. But in my heart, I got arrogant and prideful and it was so wrong. And I guess what? I reaped the consequence of it big time. And I look back and I kick myself, but, but it's a lesson to be taken for me forward to realize that, like you said, like, how'd you word it? You said, there's more in hockey. There's more to do for God. There is always more. There's more God wants to teach us. There's more God wants to do through us. We can't take our foot off the gas. Uh, for you, what was the biggest challenge to taking your foot off the gas in, that, in those years? Was it your discouragement leading to that? Was it just you thinking, I'm the youngest player in the league, I've made it? What was the biggest thing that drove you? And what can you encourage everybody to, to not take the foot off the gas if that's what they're wrestling right now? Yeah, well... Yeah, so um, I'm a big Sidney Crosby fan, um, and not, not I'm not a Penguins fan really. I'm just a Crosby fan because because he is a guy 
in the hockey world has never taken his foot off the gas. And Mike Sullivan, his coach, said this the other day, and I've been thinking about this, Gary. He said, all Sidney Crosby does is he, he becomes, he's becoming a better version of himself every day. I thought that was so good about just becoming a better version of you every day. And so like for, you know, like going back to me in, in Omaha, um, it, it, it was, again, I wasn't saved. So I just took my foot off the pedal because I thought I was great. <laughs> I thought I was so good. And I remember my coaches snapping on me and me being offended about it. And now again, my older self thinking back, thinking, oh my gosh, Glage, like you were out of, you were out to lunch. And so I think, I think for people, it's all different things that take your foot off the pedal. It's, and I think a big thing is just being consistent. Like it's hard to be consistent. And that's why people take their foot off the pedal is okay. I scored a hat trick today. A lot lot of people say, you know what? I did that yesterday. I don't need to score a hat trick today. I'm probably good for the week, but the best, Best athletes in the world. I mean, look at this for a second. Tomorrow, I want you guys to all everybody to look at the NHL and look at the NBA and look at Major League Baseball. Those are three sports going on. And I guarantee you that most of the best athletes in the world will be at the highest of the standing boards. Like the, you know, like the the best players in the NHL are going to score tonight. The best uh, NBA players are going to get points. You know, so all they just show up every day. And and that is so huge. And, and, you know, that goes deeper. We can go in a whole other conversation about being a Christian, you know, and, and stepping up every day. But, but I think that it, it's, it's so important and, and you don't have to make these, you know, leaps and bounce, like just here, down, up, down, just stay steady, Eddie. Mm-hmm. Yep. Come on. I think it's good. I think there's two huge things that can lead us to taking our feet off the pedal. Uh, you have the one side, which is pride and arrogance, like the thought, like I've made it. That's what happened to me. And that's what you're talking about. Like, I made it. You know, I'm 16. I'm in the USHL. I've made it. The other side of it is what you alluded to later, which is discouragement. Like, I am so discouraged right now. Why should I even do this? Why train? Why work at this? Why keep dreaming after something that seems impossible? This is, this, this doesn't seem like it's going to happen. And as guys, especially, if we can't win, oftentimes we don't want to play. Like we, we, we struggle to go after something that takes faith and courage, whether it's a player who's been playing for years, whether it's a young guy that's dreaming of playing college, whether it's a coach that's dreaming of, of, you know, a bunch of wins in a season and setting a new record and winning a championship. Like it takes courage to, to risk it and go after something when you're nervous and there's no guarantee. It takes faith. So we got these two spectrums. We got pride and we got discouragement. You talked about pushing through discouragement and specifically in regard to like the lies that we can hear from different coaches in our life. Right. For me, you know, you talked about your coach telling you're not a natural goal scorer. I'll never forget walking into my GM's office, my fourth season of pro uh, and, and asking him, like just opening up my heart to him and having my GM look at me and basically tell me that I don't have what it takes. He didn't, he didn't think I had what it took to make the American League. The, basically, I find out later I'm on the trade block. You know, like these guys are thinking about trying to trade me. But, man, if God wants you somewhere, you're going to be there. God clearly wanted me in Bakersfield. But, but I, I love my GM to death. But, but he, that day, massively discouraging because he didn't think I had what it took. But will that moment define me? That was a huge moment in my career. Will that adversity define me and discourage me and me throw in the towel or will it motivate me and, and I push through it? So never take your foot off the pedal. Talk to us a bit. What if somebody here is facing discouragement and they feel like, man, I, I don't know if I have what it takes. What would you encourage them today? How do they overcome the discouragement they're facing so that they don't take their foot off the pedal? Yeah, well, I think that the big thing is just know that that's going to come at some point <laughs> if you're if you're going through discouragement right now um that's one thing but if you're not you will at some point um and so i think like when you're discouraged you just got to get to the back to the root of who you are as a human being it that for me has been a life changer it's like okay clage why am i doing this and then, you know, for me, from a biblical perspective, I'm like, okay, I'm doing this for God and God's brought me here. 
And it doesn't matter, you know, again, if I'm on the fourth line or first line, but it's like going back to who you are. And then even the simplicity of the practical side of it is as a player, just go back to um, just who you are as a player, you know, and, and not try to do so much and not, you know, there's times in my career, I'm like looking over my shoulder, like to see if someone's passing me, you know, like, you know, is, is so is coach going to put me on the power play or is he going to put the guy that I'm fighting with? And can I even talk to this guy off the ice because he and I are fighting for the same position, you know, like we just get off track, we get off track and start thinking stupid st- thoughts. And it's really just getting back to, you know, who we are, who we are. And, and that can go deeper than hockey is, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you're, if you're older and you're discouraged, it's like, you know what, what's the deal here, God, this is what you have me doing. And again, eternal perspective, eternal perspective. Yeah. It really shifts our perspective of, of, am I fighting to make a name for myself or am I competing for him? Am I competing yeah. for Christ? Am my eyes set on eternity and who he declares me to be that I'm loved, that I'm accepted, that I'm significant in Christ, that I'm deeply loved, that I'm, I'm chosen and I'm washed clean and I've been given, uh, given a new life and I'm secure in Christ. And, and like you said later, that, that we're, we're disciple makers and we're witnesses and there's, there's opportunity to influence and impact for eternity. Our sport is our tool to impact lives for eternity. And, and we get that opportunity. And so when I see who he declares me to be, I start living for him. I get a brand new bolt, like, like a bolt of lightning of courage and boldness uh, and humility and love where I can step into my team and make an impact. And I'm not competing for people to think, um, think highly of me. I'm not competing to be respected for my name. I'm competing for him. And he's going to put me where he wants. And what we're going to sell his life's going to change. And we're going to be able to leave, leave a legacy. So let's close on that. And then I'm going to open it up for questions. If you got questions, please put them in the chat bar. Uh, Texas guys, text me on the phone if you, if you have a question. I know a lot of you guys are in the stands. So here we go. Here's my question. You talked about Mark Basson and about how, how one guy, God can use one guy to influence lives. And I think about that. Think about Mark in May of 1994. He comes in. Who knows if he was nervous to come to your guy's house? But he... All he does is he loves on you guys and he befriends you and he, he lives out his faith. He invites you to come to a church service that he's sharing his faith at. God moves radically, saves you and your brothers, right? In this crazy way, right? You think about your brother, Butch, having the courage to invite Mark even to the house, but like these one simple, small actions. And then all of a sudden, your life radically changes. And now to what God has done to put you in front of hundreds and hundreds of people around this country (laughs) to be able to share your story, to be able to love on people, to point them to Jesus. You have no idea the impact that, that, that God can make when we are just faithful to him. One guy. And so you talk about influence. You talk about the power of one guy. And so what would you encourage everybody here? that they could be an influencer like Mark Basson and like Clay's, like you're living brother, like you are absolutely living, you're influencing my life in a radical way and so many others. You have opportunity to make impact. What would you leave these guys with uh, in that regard? It's for them to be influencers. What would you encourage them? Um, I would say just to love people and be consistent who you are, know who you are. I mean, there was times on the road and, and, and this wasn't comfortable, but there was times where I like was by myself because I wasn't going to be a part of what guys were doing. So, so like my encouragement to, to, to you guys would be just know who you are in Christ and love people, just love them. I mean, and, and, I mean, that's what Mark did. Mark loved our family and Mark was, and, and another thing he did, he was fun. He laughed a lot. Like it was something that we know we knew we needed, but we knew we know now it was just the joy of, of God in his life um, that he had that freedom. And so that's what he brought to us is just he loved us. He spent time with us. That's another thing, too, is spending time with people and just saying, you know, he may have not wanted to come to our house that night, but, you know, he might have had better things to do. But he spent time with us. He got to know us. He listened to us. He didn't judge us. You know, these are things that as Christians we need to do. And we need just to be there for people and be that consistent person in their lives. So I love what you said there. Actually, and I can resonate. I think that's a really powerful point you make. 
It's not that he walked into your door and just started preaching and just started just just like fire hosing you with Bible. It's not like he came in guns a blazing to tell you everything you had wrong in your life to then correct you so that you would then turn your life over to the Lord. He didn't barrel through you with fear. He didn't barrel through you with judgment. He came in and he just loved on you. He asked you a hundred questions about your life. He came in and he just, he didn't judge it. He just loved on you. And, and, and at the same time, he was living a faithful life to the Lord to where you knew he was different. Your brother walked in and said, listen, we got a born again Christian coming in. Don't swear. Like your brother doesn't walk in saying that if Mark's living a double life. That's so right. Mark's living yeah. a life for the Lord. And, and he's just loving on you, right? Like wherever you're at. But he's also inviting you to come to something God's doing in his life. He invites you in. I've noticed in my life that uh, uh, one of the things that's really in fact influenced me um, is just asking people questions. Like when you sit with somebody, I would sit with guys on the bus and I just ask them a hundred questions. I just keep them talking. Just ask them questions about their life, about everything you can think of. And sooner or later, what I would feel is that my teammates would then eventually ask me a question and they would open up the door for me to share my story and share about hockey, but share about how God changed my life. And then immediately we have spiritual conversation and we get to see what God, what God's going to do. Right. But it starts with you taking time, loving on your guys, not judging them, asking them questions. That is so simple and so practical. And I just, I think that's awesome. But everybody on this call has a chance to be an impact. How, how encouraging is that? Everyone. I used to say this and I'm going to end on this. God does extraordinary things with ordinary people whose hearts are fully surrendered to him. I believe it with my whole heart. God does extraordinary things with ordinary people whose hearts are fully surrendered to him. Clage, you're living it. God's doing extraordinary things through you. Uh, when we surrender our heart, man, God does amazing things. And so I, as an encouragement to everybody on the call, young, old, college, youth, pro guys, like just being faithful, God does extraordinary things with the ordinary person whose heart is fully surrendered to him. So Clay, thanks for being an example tonight for us, man. Uh, guys, I want to answer a few questions here. Okay. I got a couple, um, I got a couple questions that have come in. Here's one. Okay. And just to kind of go on this vein, um, one of the, one of the college guys asked, okay, uh, tell us a story about how God used you to impact someone's life and how'd you do it? Just tell us a story you haven't told us real quick. How did God use you to impact someone's life? Um, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, just a quick one and I, I could tell the long version, but it was a really cool time in, in college hockey. So I, I, uh, <clears throat> I was a freshman and my coach, we, they call us in, um, and it was a team building deal deal. And I had a, I, there was a senior on the team, um, that was kind of a secret Christian and, um, and he and I became really good friends. And, uh, so anyway, <clears throat> the coach, he, um, he said, Hey, you're going to team up with somebody and you're going to go and tell someone that know, you know, something about yourself that no one knows about you. And if you're on a hockey team, um, you know, they're, they're saying funny stuff that aren't, <laughs> aren't the best clean things. And so they went through them and I was like one of the last to go. And, and, um, and I actually was up there with the guy that was a secret Christian. And he said, this is Clage Cable. And he wants everyone to know that he's a born again Christian. And that was a huge thing in my life because I was so scared. I was so scared. I was a freshman and that impacted um, this player's life. And we're still friends today. But that really opened him up to come out and say, hey, yeah, I'm a Christian. And he did that year after so many years of not doing that. And so so that was a really cool moment in the hockey world because I did not know what was going to happen. I thought. And, and, and just a, 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 um, a little side note to that that was awesome is my coach called me in the next day and he said, hey, I just want to let you know that if anyone ever makes fun of you for being a Christian, I'm cutting him that day. And I was like, wow, that's like favor there. <laughs> so awesome. so yeah, that was a cool moment for me. Boldness and courage, man. Come on. Yeah. Massively encouraging. All right. I got two other questions and we're going to wrap this thing up. And we're going to be done. Okay. You talked about uh, not building your life on sinking sand. Okay. The question, question is, how do we build our life on the rock? 
How do we not build our life on sinking sand? How do we build it on the rock as a hockey player, as a Christian athlete? Okay, so as hockey players, we train every day and we give our life to training. And we know that if we want to be successful in hockey, I mean, we got to get after it, right? Same thing as being a Christian. You got to get in the word every day and you got to spend time with Jesus because the Bible says the flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. And so when you spend time in God's word and you get to know God and you spend time with him and, and it becomes more of him and less of you, then you will, you, when hard times come, you'll be able to stay on that solid ground and not be like, oh yeah, I'm just going to you know fall because you have been grounded. It's just like training. Like when you're mid season and you've trained all summer <clears throat> and you're ready and you're you know, you're eating healthy, all that mid season, you're ready to rock. It doesn't matter if, you know, you're having a bad game or a bad shift, you can rebound and do it. So it, it's all about the word guys. It's all about spending time with God and <clears throat> becoming more like him and less like us. Mm -hmm. Come on. Final question. Final question. Uh, for those that are stepping into the off season right now. Okay. Uh, maybe they're younger. They got a dream to play in junior or in college. Okay. Question is, is how, what, what advice is as a coach now, what advice would you give to young guys or, or even to our college guys? Like what, what, what advice would you give them? How do they make it? How do we make it for, as a coach from your advice and your experience as a coach, what advice would you give to somebody that wants to make it to the next level? Well, I always love this time of year because it's a wide open field. It's like you can start and you can dream. Your season ended. You have six months until next season and you can dream for the stars. And how do you get to the next level? Well, first of all, the Bible says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so who do you think you are? Do you think you're that player? Do you think you can get there? And so, you know, so it starts there. It's like, okay, this time of year, dream big, dream, dream so big. It's like, I don't know if I can do that, you know, and, and then start trusting God because through time, God will show you, right. Oh, that's kind of off or, Hey, you know what? Yeah. I mean, again, take some time and read the Bible and look at the miracles God did. So don't think, you know, you can dream too big. The Bible says that we can do all things, right. All things, not some things, all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so as you go into this off season, I just encourage you guys to dream big and go for it. Like go for it. Like you've never gone for it again, because I will tell you this and Gary can attest to this and my brothers and whoever else is on this call can attest to this that are older. You're not going back. Mm -hmm. So go for it. Now you're go for it. Now. Like I, I can't, I can't say tomorrow, Hey, I'm putting the gear on. I'm going to go play for the Tulsa Oilers. It's not happening. And so you only have a little time in your career to do something special. And so Man, put everything else aside because all the other stuff will be there when your career is over. But don't don't be a kid. My dad always said said this. Don't be someone that says I could have if I would have. Hmm. Like if I would have put the time in, if I would have got up early, if I would have not maybe got off my Xbox or box or my phone at night and went to bed. Like that was a little dig, by the way. Um, but just you know, like if, if I would have done that stuff, I could have made it. And you don't want to be a forty six year old guy that looks back and said, man, I didn't, I didn't throw my heart into it. Like at least look back and say, I gave it everything I had. Come on. I love it, dude. Fires me up. I want to get the gear on and go back and play. <laughs> <laughs> That's so inspiring. Man, it fires me up to dream big. That is great encouragement. What a fantastic night, friends. I am so encouraged. And, and Clage, again, thank you, brother. Thank you for sharing. Hey, in closing, everybody, I just want to offer up a couple things uh, that you might be interested in. Okay, the Pure Encouragement Podcast. If you haven't heard about it, check it out. Uh, it's a it's a podcast that I run. We give about two two or three episodes a month, and uh, and we are helping competitors train train competitors for christ and we're doing a confidence series this year uh that we're going through just talking about different ways to be confident how you could be confident so check it out they're 10 to 15 minute clips occasionally there's some interviews hopefully that can encourage you second thing um this off season uh, i am going to be coming out with a way to train the conf train athletes with confidence and, and I need some guinea pigs, so to speak, some, some young guys. I need some junior players. I need some college guys uh, that would be willing to just 
uh, basically be some of the first people to go through this stuff uh, and give me feedback on ways that we can make it better. So I'm getting a couple of guinea pigs before we release it to the public, you know, nationwide and worldwide. We're going to take some guinea pigs through. If you have any interest in that, please email me or call me or text me. I tracked down my number. You can find it. It's Gary at GarySteffes.com. Very simple. Uh, send me a note. I would love to get you in. I'm looking for uh, probably 12 people in each age group would be great. Okay. And then final thing, guys, we do this every month behind the scenes, uh, the second or third Monday of the month, we get together and have a guy share his story. Uh, and so I hope you'll come back. But to close it out, um, I'm going to pray it out. But here's the last thing I would ask you to do is you're leaving tonight. Uh, will you please, before you leave, just put in the chat bar, what is one thing that God used Clage tonight to impact your life with? Will you write it in the chat bar or college guys, you can text me directly and I'll share it with Clage. Uh, what is one thing that God used Clage to impact your life with tonight? And let's just refresh and encourage his heart for sharing his story with us tonight. All right, so please send those in. I'll pray us out. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for all of these athletes all around the country, Lord. Uh, I'm so thankful. Will you bless them? Will you bless Clage? Will you bless his family uh, in every way, Lord? We bless them, and we just say thank you for tonight. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We want to compete for you, and we help us do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All righty. Friends, you're dismissed.